Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and welcome to another episode of Deep Web Browsing, episode 101. We're past the 100 episode mark, and now we're on to the next, I guess, set of episodes, whatever you want to call it. For me, it's always just sitting back, relaxing on a lovely Sunday, ending the week off with uh, the final video of that week being the browsing of the side of the internet. It's a little too danker for regular viewing. That being said, I'm going to keep this intro short and sweet as always, and we're going to go into our very first website right after this cut. So the uh, first website that we've come across is the Experiment the Chip ID Chip, ladies and gentlemen. This is a product of Global Monetary. Now, copyright 1999, it's an old fucking site, it seems, so we're actually going to go right into uh, clicking the ID Chip, which is apparently right into our hands. We're going to hit enter on that. Now, what is this? Welcome to the ID chip experiment. ID chip bio, plant, uh, to bio implant technology. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there's actually like, this is actually like, as, as, as sci-fi as it sounds, this is actually like a reality. Uh, there are like people who put like uh, little NFC chips into their fucking like thumbs and shit like that. Like you can like implant that stuff. Like it's basically, for those of you who don't know, like, you can get like you can get like NFC stickers and shit, and basically you can implant them with like a certain code, or uh, you know, fuck. If you ever like seen uh, those Wi-Fi NFC chips, basically what you do if you have an NFC enabled phone, right? You would take your phone, and you would like place it onto the tag, and it would instantly connect you to the wireless hotspot. And there's like tags for a bunch of stuff too, uh, NFC tags like ones that'll help you putting into your car and then it'll detect that you're connected to your car it'll connect it via bluetooth all that stuff so this stuff is already a reality the id chip experiment is just an old fucking site this is before the concept of near field communications so we're gonna go into this this is apocalypse averted world saved i always love reading about the fucking apocalypse let me go into this everyone remain calm the antichrist is not among us <laughs> remain calm all right the, the site was intended to be a little more than a mild curiosity, not a cataclysmic event. I had no reason to expect more than just a few curious folks to visit this site per day. It was to be an embodiment of millennial angst, from which I was going to compile responses, etc. I don't know it was going to turn into the War of the World Internet Edition. I think this guy's kind of like selling this site a little more than I would expect. I would like to apologize to everyone who, for whatever reason, thought this was real. Uh, and I wasn't. I wasn't sitting here, uh, you know, thinking this was 100% real. Now, it was never my intent to cause widespread hysteria. When it was apparent that this was that this was what was happening, I revealed to all that the ID chip was not for real. Man, you should have fucking done that, Bill Cross. All right, you you could have fucked with more and more people. You have to you, come on, man. Who's gonna actually believe this shit was fucking real? So why and how it was done? Let's see this. Sometime in July, I decided that I was going to build this. So this is just basically a biography on this, how this guy created a website that spooked like maybe two or three old grannies at a retirement home. I decided that I was going to build a specialty website for comedy writers. I wanted to do the web design and layout myself, but my webmastering skills were sorely lacking. Hey man, we, we all start somewhere, right? I thought it would be best to get some practice first on something less important, maybe some sort of art project. Y2K was coming up, so I thought, oh yeah, it's 1999. This is back when we thought the fucking computers was gonna, were going to go all apeshit because uh, they weren't going to store, you know, 2000 properly. All right, fair enough. Uh, uh, how about a spoof of a company that's selling the Mark of the Beast? Yeah, actually, I remember this shit. Back in, like, the ninth grade, there was this, uh, there was this Chinese girl who was, like, religious and shit. Like, she was, like, really, she was, a, was, she was Catholic and everything. And she told me that, you know, the mark of the beast that they thought that they were gonna have, like, chips planted, like, right into the forehead over here. And it was gonna fucking, it was gonna have all control over us. People were gonna be watching us all the time. The mark of the beast and all that. Yeah, I do remember something like that, except it wasn't in the hand, like, this person saying... I mean, it could be, you know, whatever. I mean, it's actually crazy because a lot of people do believe that this is like a sign of the end times and shit like that. Like, again, this is and I, I guess it makes sense. You know what I mean? Like people are going to sit over there thinking that because you're getting ID tagged. It kind of it seems like the mark of the beast almost, right? Uh, the site was launched inadvertently on t Tuesday 17th by a visiting friend who didn't understand that I had made it public yet. As it turns out, it was sort of akin to the president of the U.S. stepping out of the bathroom to find that his drinking buddy had just launched World War III. He posted, on a small number of Usenet groups, something to the effect that there was a company selling the mark of the beast at idchip.com. 
Well, that's why you don't leave your computer unlocked around people when you're covering sensitive shit, right? Although, that's got to be the fucking most hilarious shit I've ever seen. Like, could you imagine the Usenet postings right there? For those of you who don't know, Usenet is basically like message boards and shit back then. All right, let's go back out of the ID chip experiment. Show me the ID chip website. All right, let's see the actual fucking thing. So this is a site he made, Global Monetary. This fucked with people back in the day. All right, let's go to Global Monetary. Become an ID chip member and receive $250. Dolans. That's a lot of Dolans for back in 1999, by the way. We're talking about fucking overinflation, right? FAQ. I'm concerned about getting an implant. What can you tell me about it? The ID chip implant is a very small electronic device that is painlessly implanted in the tissue of your right palm. It leaves no scar and is not visible in any way. You will not be able to feel it in your hand, as the device is mostly soft, flexible plastic. It will never need to be removed as it is continually recharged by the proprietary mouse. People have been made frightened of such devices by television programs, but there is no justifiable reasonable for concern. Pacemaker heart implants, which involve a much more invasive installation process, have no such stigma associated with them, and birth control implants have been used successfully for years. How do I know I am qualified to become an ID chip member? All right, how are you qualified? Everyone, everyone will be, eventually everyone will be qualified to become a member, but for now, all you need is to be, a, all you need is a qualified computer and to meet the demographic qualifications. Now, back in the day, you needed to have, like, at least a Pentium fucking 3 to get an implant, all right? Pentium 4, you were fucking given the implants at that point, motherfucker. H how I sign up to become a member of... Okay, obviously we know how to fucking sign up. Uh, how can global monetary afford to pay so much money to get people to join? This is a point that puzzles many people. However, one only needs to look at the valuations of cable and internet companies to understand. Take, for example, the recent acquisition of Gannett Co, Co. Cable assets by Cox Communications for an amount equal to 5100 per subscriber. eBay, all right, so basically they, they got money, all right? They, they, got, they got some money going on, apparently. All right, let's go see employment. Uh, maybe you want to work at it, right? Uh, oh, oh, man, all these jobs are <laughs> making you want to kill yourself. Uh, about us, let's see. Global Monetary LLP is a closely held partnership with over 5 billion dolans in assets. Our primary goal is to establish a secure and affordable means of engaging in transactions both over the internet and in person. It has made a bold leap into the field of subdermal implants to build such a system. Now, hold on. As we're looking into this, right? This is like a regular fucking site. Back in the day, I probably would have believed this shit to an extent, right? But, like, oh, he's got, like, emails people send him to. This site doesn't seem really fucking scary, to be honest, but people send him these emails. One of them is, you are one very dangerous organization that needs to be dissolved. You gift, you gift wrap your sinister motives, and basically you want to control each and every person. Apparently, you think we are a world of idiots and don't uh, see through you like tracing paper. All right, I rest my case. Oh my god. To whom it may concern, this person wrote it in all caps, by the way. The use of chips embedded in human flesh is immoral. It's against God. Is this another plan to make the rich richer? If the Rothschilds are involved, I'm sure it is. This, I'm... Ooh, I got a text. This, I'm sure, the same family that helped Hitler. <laughs> what the fuck is this, dude? Jesus Christ, man. Same family that fucking helped Hitler. These motherfuckers, dude. These motherfuckers. All right, let's see this. This is one of the funniest, most excellent hoaxes I've seen. Yeah, it's pretty much a fucking hoax, right? But basically, the messages he got, Jesus, Jesus Christ, dude. This guy. What was the secret page? Okay, the secret page. Let's see this. Uh, one of the ID chips right over here. This is a secret page. Developer. All right, this is, the, this is the job he offered. Must be gullible enough to think this company is for real, but smart enough to follow this tiny URL, plus two years of system development experience. All right, it's got, all right, he's, fuck, he's a fucking joker, it seems. So it seems like the ID chip experiment used to be a site that confused the fuck out of people, but now it's just there as a memento to let you know that people were actually fooled for this shit. I will admit, the best part of this first segment is the fucking all caps. Same family that helped Hitler, Jesus Christ. Thank you for making this video non-family friendly. <laughs> Let's go to something else. Daryl Sims, the Ala Mao Hunter. Oh boy, all right, you know it's gonna be great when this dude's off the coast of what seems to be Miami with a cowboy hat and like fucking almost BDU gear on. Daryl Sims, the Ala Mao Hunter. 
All right. The world's leading expert on alien abduction. You know how many fucking people I've seen just in the series that claim I am the world's leading expert on ghost rectums. I'm the world's leading expert on alien fucking, you know, lungs. I'm the world's leading expert on Casper. Everyone's a goddamn expert. Okay, but let's see what Daryl Sims is. So his 38 plus years of field research has focused on physical evidence and led to his groundbreaking discoveries of alien implants. All right, now I'm intrigued. This is discovery. He's got evidence. As a former military police officer and CIA operative. What? Okay. This is legit if this is the case. Sims has a unique insight to the alien organization, which he believes functions similarly to an intelligence agency. All right, so... The, the, you heard it right here. Aliens are like the fucking NSA, all right? So, fair enough. They, they... <laughs> what the fuck, man? All right, we're going to open up the alien implants. This is this is the key uh, deciding factor of what the fuck this is all about. Oh, he's written a book. Okay. In this book, Alamau Hunter, Evidence and Truth About Alamau Implants, you will read the truth behind Alamau Implants from the researcher who started it all. Daryl Dar Sims, what the fuck are you? Like an alien hunter, researcher, CIA operative? What the fuck, man? Uh, anyways, abduction researcher Daryl Sims is a pioneer in the field of alleged alien implants. Well, obviously you're a fucking pioneer. I don't think anybody's really, you know, created the science of alien implants. He has the largest collection of alleged alien implants and artifacts to date. All right, at least proper words we've used. And each object has its own fascinating theory. I bet you probably like, oh man... This this uh this uh this water bottle cap this is this is an alien uh, antenna this is used to you know you jam this into, into somebody's ear and bam you can hear it come on man uh, anyways you know enough dicking around the alien hunter quietly began collecting alien artifacts that allegedly came from the human body some of these were surgically removed and then given to him by patients while others were expelled naturally from the body okay uh. <laughs> Sim sees implants as a relatively rare phenomenon, perhaps affecting less than 1% of the abductee population. Yet in 1995, he finally felt the evidence was compelling enough to formally document the removal of alleged objects from two of his most promising cases. So, prediction. In 1994, the year I was born, Daryl was invited to speak at an American Medical Association conference at John Muir Medical Center in California Bay Area. The title of his talk, Medical Complications of Alleged Alien Abductions. This probably happened, to be honest. All right, so number one, the object would not contain technology. The tissue surrounding the object would not exhibit inflammation, either chronic or acute. There would be nerve cells present in parts of the body where they were not naturally occurring. Besides the metallic objects, you will begin to see a biological implant, a cluster of brain cells in another part of the body. Naturally, many of the doctors in town told them that these situations would be highly unusual, to say the least. The surgeons who performed the 1995 surgeries he arranged the same things before they undertook the uh, operations, to everyone's surprise. Daryl's predictions were fucking accurate. Now I'm intrigued. Two major studies have been done on the recovered objects. One by New Mexico Tech University and the other by Los Alamos Labs. The results were intriguing, though not conclusive. Blind testing done at the Los Alamos Labs revealed extraterrestrial isotopes such as would be seen in a rare meteor. Additionally, the form of the metal suggested manufacture as opposed to natural origins. When the scientists discovered that the objects had come from the human body, they scrambled to make sense of what they had just put on record. This set off a veritable firestorm of activity within the UFO community. Suddenly, every abductee began to believe that they had an alien implant. Claims were made about the phenomenon by others that were inconsistent with the evidence. Unfortunately, some of these misconceptions persist. Since those heady days of 1995, conventional implant technology has emerged. From microchips in the family dog, to medical implants to dispense homo, uh, the hormones... Still, others have put forth claims of nefarious government implants, which has further clouded the issue. Okay, so because Daryl Sims at one point had two cases of this shit actually being the case, it seems. Again, I don't, I don't have any evidence right here, but it seems like it was the case. Everyone was like, oh, I, I, I have an implant too. And then somehow they were like, well, the CIA probably implanted or some shit. And then it got cloudy right out of there. Sorry, right. apparently the alien implants are fucking real. Daryl Sims has it covered. And you know what? I I'll give Daryl Sims some of the doubt. If his credentials are true, he probably doesn't have a reason to lie. He's, he's had a fucking good, like, career. And maybe he's really passionate about this. So, so maybe. Anyways, let's see this. 
One kid who didn't buy it by Daryl Sims, all right, he wrote a little alien abduction story. The very first time I saw the entity, I would not accept a suggestive command you will not remember. Let me start at the beginning with my first conscious event. The year is 1952. I'm between three and a half to four years old and lying in the bed in 105, 1005 uh, South K Saint in Midland, Texas. An AC unit not quite fitted to the uh, window allows cold night air into the room. There is a name on the cooler unit, but I can't read yet, so I can't tell what it says. Uh, okay, alright, so it seems like he's got a little fucking story right here. Alien becomes a clown? <laughs> what the fuck is this, it? <laughs> what, are, what are we doing here, man? All right, all right, you know, Daryl Sims, I'll give you that. Abductee questionnaire, oh boy, questionnaire, okay. If you believe you or someone close to you have had an alien abduction or contact experience, then this section is for you. These few questions are decide to assist you in drawing forth memories. All right, so the, if I was abducted, this might bring me memories. In your recall of the experience, can you remember the details of the alleged Alimau image? Specifically, can you describe its feet or the inside of the mouth? Oof. No, I'd, I wouldn't know. If you answered yes to question one, were you able to touch it? Do you recall how the alleged alien communicated with you? Do you know where the alien touched you? If you answered yes to question three, did you observe them working as a team? All right, see, but, like, the problem with these questions is, like, if one of the questions is barely recalled in your head, you might start making up question three and five and then even six. You know what I mean? Like, you might start, your brain might start making that shit up. All right, aside from that, they got a support section as well. So if you, if you need a support section, you definitely have it. Uh, UFO News, Roswell, we have already heard a shit ton of Roswell. They got videos. Uh, like, Daryl Sims, uh, this is from him in Italy. Physical evidence. All right, this, is a, this fun shoot was done for Sony TV. They made me out all serious, but I have a really good sense of humor, I promise. All right, fair enough. Let's go to the alien implant from India. All right, interesting. Young alien hunters in India. Daryl Sims at Taj with Hitesh K. Yadav and Shivana, uh, Shivana Shukla. Just back from my trip to India, and it was epic in many ways. To experience this rich ancient culture firsthand was a wonderful experience. All right, wait, what did he find? India implant in situ. My investigators were impressed with their story. The details and clarity, blah, blah, blah. Oh, wait, so they... Okay, the case they uncovered that brought me to India involves a bright bright professional woman in her early 30s she and some of her family members have experienced multiple contact with what to describe as children as monkey people our patient has a recall her patient has recall of receiving alien implants at various times in her life the surgery okay wait what is this the, so this is the object they found. The metallic object was visible beneath the skin as a lump. The patient was resolute to have it removed surgically which would be a simple procedure. She was also interested in learning more about her contact experiences than she was able to remember. She was very eager for me to come over and see the surgery personally and work with her privately. The surgery was going to be performed in Delhi under conventional medical setting. The surgeon and the hospital director were very cooperative. They followed my directions about handling the object and importantly maintaining chain of custody. The entire procedure was documented on video and includes five witnesses besides myself. The implant in its biological casing, so, like, this is the implant, but around it's, like, the skin, where they had, like, I guess, brain cells and shit like that. This? See, like, this is the interesting thing, okay? Like, there's not much more for me to really look at over here, but, like, if this is fucking real, I gotta say, Daryl Sims, though, out of all the people that we've looked at, seems to be the most legit out of all of them. That's tough to say, man. Could Daryl Sims have the uh, secrets behind alien implants? I mean, there's a very specific part of aliens. It's not like Area 51 or alien abductions. No, it's specifically implants from aliens. Whether it's real or not, I, I don't know. The world is a big fucking place. Maybe Daryl Sims has concrete proof about aliens, you know, sticking shit into us. But at the end of the day, I'm going to keep my skepticism high, and we're going to go to something else. This has been a weird episode so far, let me tell you. Hello, guys and gals. It seems like we got our deep web video of the week. It seems that uh, we've got this man in a mask with uh, X pasties all over the eyes, pouring out milk from a jug, uh, a la Canada. And <laughs> I used to have that fucking laptop. And about that being said... We, this video is 45 seconds in length. We gotta hit play to see where we really go to. The video already starts off weirder than what I expect, just with that fucking face. Well, let's hit play and see where things go. 
Okay? Fucking slow. What the fuck? Alrighty then. That's a little weird. Fucking things took a turn for the fucking, you know, worst right there. What's going on? Why the fuck would you do this? What's going on? It's just some dude breaking his fucking laptop. What the fuck was that? Like what? What, what, what was that? What was that? What was this goddamn? What, what, what was the video even like? Okay. Yeah, I used to, I used to own this laptop. By the way, I know that very well. It's one of those HP. It's got a little touch bar controls. But like, okay. Going into this video, I have no idea what to really fucking take out of the situation. This guy is pouring milk out of this fucking jug, right? Fair enough. Out of fucking nowhere, this dude just... He just he straight up just... He just starts hitting the thing with a fucking hammer. He's got, like, some music playing in the background, which I'll probably have to, like, kind of edit out. I don't know how it works out. But it's just, it doesn't even sound like music. It just sounds like screaming. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a video over here... I really can't explain. So, like, as far as it goes, first thing that he does, hits it slow-mo with the fucking hammer. Alright? And so, like, this person over here, the video didn't even, like, start. If you look into it, well, no, the video's going there. It's just pouring, like, what appears to be, like, wa hot water. Hits it slightly. And you just go off with this dude, like, zooming in for a little bit. Video doesn't run. It seems like the screen on initial impact stopped giving in a single fuck. Wait, no. I think, I think it might be giving some response. But then he just fucking proceeds to do this shit. And breaks it crazy. So the way I see it is an old laptop. Guy just wanted to break it. But he put some edgy shit on there. And played it. And he's just there to like try and spook us. But I don't know what the hell it was. Like, it's kind of spooky from like the fact that why the fuck this would happen. But at the same time, I'm going to leave it to the fact that this person... Probably just wanted to break a laptop screen, but wanted to do it in an edgy way that was going to spook the fuck out of some people. So, hey man, I guess uh, I can't say for sure that no computers were harmed in the making of this video because clearly this HP computer got a fucking bludgeoning to the face. But uh, hey, if you got any fucking answers to a 45 second video of a dude hammering a fucking computer screen with some creepy shit in there... By all means, go for it. And this isn't the only time I've ever had the iPhone resolution. The last time we had it was like that fucking... The Indonesian ghost thing or whatever the fuck it was. I'm just saying Indonesian because like... For some fucking reason... That's where, that's where like most of this like ghost CCTV shit happens, man. So, fuck, dude. You know what? I don't know what to say, man. You got me there. Could be some weird like... Could be something weird, dude. Could just be some fucking weird... Maybe it's not even a whole video, you know what I mean? Maybe it's, like, just cut and, like, posted in, like, a little tiny form. That being said, I'm gonna end with you all being the true analyzers over here. The video is weird as fuck. But, hey, let's back out of this and uh, go to something a little more coherent. Introduction. Visit the skeletal remains of a Cold War weapon. This presentation will take you on a full tour of a decommissioned, abandoned, underground missile complex. The site was opened many years ago by explorers and vandals and people who really loved the new JPEG they found on Google. And in fact, the technology therein was nearly obsolete by the time the bases were completed in 1963, so there's a little secret about it beyond the location of the site, which we will not reveal here. We were violating federal trespassing laws by visiting this installation, and we were risking our health and lives in the process. We also were caught. This was second-degree criminal trespass. Felony charges will haunt you the rest of your life, even in the middle of nowhere. They're watching. Please do not try to enter one of these sites yourself. Had one of us been hurt beneath the surface, it would have been very difficult to remove the victim body, given the condition of the entrance, not to mention the presence of asbestos, and many other chemicals in the tunnels because of the poor air circulation. All right, so don't fucking do this. These people got busted because of it, unfortunately. But let's go into this, okay? Let's see where they went to. This is a missile base that was functional up until the point of the late 1960s and was decommissioned. All right, so this is this is the abandoned road that led to the site, all right? You can see, like, the fucking grass coming through the cracks and shit. Nature's taken its hold a little bit. Let's go more into it, okay? 
Standing at, oh, why the fuck censor your face at this point? You're already busted. Standing at the entrance, which looks like an emergency access hatch, the real staircase down to the complex was sealed off and is under the metal lid in the foreground. These people actually can go into some place they're not allowed to? This is intriguing. So, we were standing on a platform atop the elevator shaft, looking down at the entrance pit. The concrete column, painted toxic, was apparently dropped into the pit to block passage but really provided a means of climbing down. Beyond the column is a small, dark room containing the sealed-off staircase to the surface. The steps down into the elevator shaft are to the right of the photo. True for all the underground photos, the place is not usually this brightly lit. There is no electricity at the site, and everything is musty, damp, pitch black, right? So this is all external lighting from them. So as we go down further, let me actually open this up real quick. They get it. It seems like there is still a lot of graffiti as they go downstairs, but they're working their way they're down. They're, they're working their way down through these stairs and they apparently disappear into the water just beneath the main level so there's a little bit of like you know water build up of course but as they go through over here you're still getting more and more graffiti and shit but they got heavy steel blast doors for the main entrance so they're really keeping some shit safe behind but as you go into here it's got this like bunker layout oh you can see you could dude Oh, this probably smells like ass when you get down there. Probably, like, gives you a little bit of, like, a mind-numbing headache. I can already tell, let me tell you right now. So, this is just past the blast doors. Alright, they got water tanks and shit. They've got, like, communication silos. But as you go further into it, it's, yeah, there's still people down here. Look at the amount of graffiti, dude. Like, you got a little fuck you written over there. The zone, apparently, is right here. But this is the living area for the crew. Alright, fair enough. Oh, wait, can we go through? Oh, wait, no, this is going into the boiler room section of things, it seems. So this is the environment control room, as they want to call it, that runs air systems, water systems, four diesel power generators, each capable of generating one megawatt. That's a lot of fucking power, to be honest. But, uh, uh, no, you can't really go further into it. Let's go down here. And you can go further that way. Oh, huh. Oh, okay, enter the launch area tunnel. What is this? This junction in the tunnel from the main junction to the rest of the launch area is a steel floor, open in the center showing the support structures underneath. The light yellow door on the left is labeled fuel room. Alright, but you can go right to the fuel room as well, right? Which, that place looks like a fucking mess. But it reeks of kerosene, fair enough. That's the gas, so probably, that's the fuel they're using, definitely. Uh, this place, is, oh, it's got photos. This leads to launch area 1, while the tunnel across the room leads to launch areas 2 and 3. So these are like missile silos. Jesus. You go over here. Launch air filtration work center code. Huh. You keep on going down. It's just a bigger, bigger rabbit hole, to be honest. Silo number three. Fuel silo, whatnot. You keep going. Oh, my God, dude. This thing goes fucking deep, bro. Holy crap. See, like, at this point, once you see, like, this and this, you don't want to fucking go even further into this shit. All right, go to the map real quick. All right, let's, uh, here, we're, here we're back in the map again. This is the missile complex. Now, the thing is, is that, like, this shit is weird. Because, like, obviously this is from, like, the Cold War, right? But the thing is, is, like, I would always be under the assumption that if the U.S. has missile silos, is it typically normal for you to just abandon a missile silo? Like, a nuclear missile silo or a missile silo in general, do you typically abandon that or do you just keep it operating? I mean... Under the assumption that, you know, say the Cold War was over and you were with another enemy faction or they always have, like, you know, something planted on Russia, for example. Like, do you abandon it? Like, that's a lot of fucking money you invested into making a missile silo to just upfront abandon shit, right? It doesn't really make any sense to me. But, hey, you know, I'm not I'm not the fucking United States, right? I don't, I don't run this country. But these people got busted for going into this situation, which you probably shouldn't fucking do. Wait, what is this? No nukes? The doorway after the control saw decorated with graffiti that probably showed up after the Air Force moved out. Yeah, they wouldn't leave nukes back over there. That's grossly high out of, they would be high out of their mind, dude. But you're going around over here, you can see that they have, like, control computers and shit back then, right? In, like, the 50s and crap. Uh, you can go look at the computers and whatnot. Yeah, here's here's a launch control computers back then, dude. Shit was uh shit shit was something. They got law they got log recorders. They got like uh they got analyzers shit like that. Good stuff to be honest. Service tunnels right. They checked everything by the way too. And this is again a, another shot of the rocket silo, which again you have to think about it too. 
the actual, like, health hazards of going down there are so fucking sky high. The fact they got busted, like, a slap on the wrist is nothing. Because I think, like, breaking into any military structure is, like, straight up. Like, you, you, you'd you go fucking missing for that shit. So these guys probably got off with a, with a pretty uh, lenient slap on the wrist, if anything. There's not much to really look at. A bunch of people illegally broke into a missile silo, and they took photos, and we in the world get to see. So, hey, you know, you get to see something new every day. Places that not everyone really gets to go to. So while we look at the part of the internet that's a little too dank for regular viewing, these people go to the parts of the world that's a little too dank for regular uh, exploring. So hopefully they're fine. You know, hopefully Kevin Kelm's got this shit covered. You can email him if you want. I'm not going to do it. But uh, hey, it's right there. So I'm going to I'm gonna fucking cancel it real quick. Oh shit. Yes, exit. Thank you. But uh, yeah, let's go to the next website, see what's up. So this is an interesting uh, site right over here. The International Center for Bathroom Etiquette. Performing number one and number two in comfort and style since 1995. I believe I have shown you people this website. I think I have. But apparently they got the clearnet side of things, icbe.org. And this site is dedicated to teaching you how to piss in public and shit in public with great class. It is a website for everything, man. Like, you know how there's activists for every single thing now in the world? There's a fucking website for every single thing. When we, when you need to learn how to take a shit appropriately, you, you, you can't say you didn't know. The, uh, the reading materials exist. So what is this? Uh, improve the bathroom going experience for everyone. That's actually pretty true, man. There's some people that you, you know, like a fucking McDonald's bathroom after a fucking meal. It smells like piss and shit just because everyone fucking is an asshole and they're like piss in the corner of the fucking room like a dumbass. Like, yeah, you know, some people need urinal etiquettes. Let's read something about urinal etiquettes, man. A little too much information I gave away. I have like some problems going to like public bathrooms, let me tell you. Men's urinal etiquette is a complex beast. So many urinals, so many choices, and so many errant paths to choose. Let us help you make the right decision when faced with the modern public bathroom. Other urinal etiquette pages. All right, so can, can I fucking make this thing, like, abundantly clear, too? Like, <laughs> like I get you're not supposed to maybe piss next to someone, but, like, in a grave time, you got to do what you got to do. All right, let's go through your general urinal etiquette. All right, let's see this. If you are lucky and rarely, let me actually blow up the text a little bit. If you are lucky and rarely this is a situation, you may be on the receiving end of what is only known as the ideal situation. The situation is, of course, the presence of one urinal. The etiquette here is simple. If it's empty, pee. If it's not, don't. Period. Of course, a foray to the world of the public stall should be merited if the urinal is busy. But it is always preferable to busy oneself with washroom-related activity while waiting for the urinal to free up. Wash your hands, check your hair, check the floor for loose change, do the moonwalk, etc. An important note is, it is not considered proper etiquette to ask a peeing person if he is almost done. Dude, that's a fucking dependable thing sometimes. There are some people, you go to a bathroom, and you will fucking be shocked. Some dudes... Especially at a fucking bar. They'll be pissing for like five minutes straight, dude. Like, they got a bladder fucking problem at that point. At, at that point, you're not asking, are you almost done? Are you okay, motherfucker? Because you just pissed out like four gallons right now and you're still going. All right, an important note. It is not considered proper etiquette. Yeah, okay, we got this. If you suspect the patron is merely standing around with his fly open, it is usually best just to keep those suspicions to yourself. But you can, you can hear it. You know what I mean? Your ears can pick up if it's used. Kitty-sized urinals. If you, it has brought to several of my attention over the past months that there is a serious need for guidance on the subject of kitty-sized urinals. You know the ones I'm talking about. The ones that look like they were accidentally installed for an elementary school. The ones that look like they might be useful if for some reason you were to pee out of your knee. This demand increased in several months of research and experimentation. Does a part of your male anatomy most crucial for peeing actually locate itself completely above the kitty-sized urinal? If yes, please refrain from using the urinal. If no, proceed to question two. Do you have to bend down to flush the urinal? If yes, please refrain from using the urinal. Are you unable to see the urinal due to your protrusion of your stomach? If yes, oh man, are you asking me if I'm too thick? All right, damn straight. Would it be more comfortable for you to use the urinal standing on your knees? If yes, please, yeah, probably, all right? Never pee next to a kitty urinal unless your child is using it. Attempt to leave two urinals between you and the kitty urinal so that a child and his father might use them. Instantly avert your eyes if a child is using it so you don't get beaten up. <laughs> what the fuck am I reading, motherfucker? I'm reading how to piss. All right, look, teach me how to piss at home, all right? 
Uh, bathroom etiquette at home. Sure, teach me right now. If you live alone and have no guests, do what you want. Damn straight. Leave the damn seat down. Yes, you heard me correctly. Stop being a lazy men and put the darn seat back down. Really? Is it so hard to do something thoughtful for the woman in your life? How would you feel if you sat down directly into the toilet bowl one day? Not so hot, huh? End conversation and confrontational tone. There have been studies done which show that the most efficient thing to do is simply to leave the seat in whatever position it was when you finished up. But this is one of those cases where we think women need a break. You know, pro oh, somebody fucking came over. It's probably fucking, it's probably, it's probably somebody trying to sell me something. Fuck that shit. I'm learning how to pee properly. Don't pee in the shower. Use the fan. Replace, dude, you can't even say don't pee in the shower. Sometimes you get really fucking hammered and you come home and that's the first thing you fucking do. All right, anyways, I think we're spending too much time on the topic of pissing. We're going to go to the international bathroom side of things and see just how people piss all over the world. So, okay, so they got different bathroom etiquette for Australia. Canada, the Czech Republic, England, Germany, Greece, Iran, Japan. Let's see what Japan is like. I'm going to Japan next month, so let's see what the fuck Japan is about. Anybody who's ever traveled to Japan will tell you that going to the bathroom, there's nothing like going to the bathroom here in North America. Uh, provide us with an actual piece of an actual Japanese bathroom with a kimono and a bajillion buttons. No, we don't have a clue how it works. Yeah, you see, like, that's fucking weird, dude. Like, you got two toilet paper rolls, you gotta pick which ply you're gonna be using. You got that flush, but you got this fucking airplane goddamn entertainment flight system down over here like goddamn bro loyal reader michelle an american currently living in japan relates her own experiences with japanese toilets two different types of toilets the squatty potty is in the western style oh dude the squatty potties are fucking horrible you gotta like bend dude and like you're taking a nice shit you gotta get up Ooh, are your legs gone dude they're fucking jelly squatting is actually healthier for the body doesn't feel too good yeah sometimes we like to just sit and take our shit okay it's it's what it is. All right, I get it. I can use a squatty, man, but sometimes you just want to, like, shit properly. I really hope nobody's eating while you're watching this video, by the way. This is this is not the video for you, let me tell you. They got a fucking etiquette bear right there. If you saw a bear in a urinal, sorry for that little glitch over there, but bears are cute. Let me tell you, cutest way to die. But I think I'm going to end it over here. When I go to Japan, I'll show you the fucking bathroom uh, technologies that they have. And I'll show you how to shit over there by myself. That being said, we're going to back out of this and go head up something else. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the minus Y2K bug, what really plagued ancient Egypt and freed the Hebrew slaves. So you've heard of the Y2K bug, but have you heard of the negative Y2K bug? I haven't, but today we're going to be figuring it out. Don't be fooled by the massive cover-up of the Y2K problem. The government says... All right. The government says that they solved any problem with the millennial bug and that nothing serious happened. Fools! The new millennium doesn't even begin until 2001, so we haven't had the chance to get the full impact. Uh, so 2000 was just the, oh, so Y2K was just phase one of the disaster. The real impact will be 2001. Man, that's such a dickish thing to do. There's people genuinely afraid of fucking Y2K. And they're like, January 1st fucking hit, and they like woke up that day, it's like, oh god, we're saved, thank you. And then some dick on the internet had to just be like, oh no, it's actually next to your motherfucker, it just started. <laughs> like, fuck you, dude. Egypt, once a glorious empire and the wonder of all the world, it was suddenly toppled by a catastrophe. So traumatic that Egyptian civilization was set back thousands of years. Ancient Egypt, as many people know, had advanced tech. So advanced, in fact, that even respectable scholars have been inescapably led to conclude that it must have come from some advanced Elamau race. Blessed with abundant sand, and some would say gifts from other world, Egypt entered the Silicon Age around 1450 BC, during the reign of the enlightened Pharaoh Hunk Amen Ra. One of the first great dictators wise enough to liberally fund university research, electricity, integrated chips, and even remote computer oh, sorry, even computer equipment soon became an integral part of Egyptian culture. I think this is a little bit of a joke website, but I don't know. All right, so anyways, so this will all change after a uh, minus Y2K. For reasons that will soon be apparent, later dynasties would trash all remnants of Egypt's great Silicon Age, but these so-called scholars have a very hard time explaining away a number of authentic ancient Egyptian finds that survived the purges of later dynasty. Okay, so here we go. We've got the original depiction. This dude has a lovely MS Paint clip art of fucking a Mac. What is that? A fucking, an, an, old, an old Macintosh? And now over here, they actually edited that out. Modern censorship. 
<laughs> in the original figure above, Harthor is wearing a stylized CD player, probably, uh, on her head. C CDs were called luminary discs in that day and are often mistaken for depictions of the sun by ignorant scholars today. Further, Hathor is receiving sacred hardware gifts from Matt, including what appears to be a cellular phone and a computer with a monitor. Keyboards and mice were considered unclean in Egyptian religion of the day and typically are not depicted. Yeah, man, fuck any form of IO peripherals, dude. Though it is understood that Hathor will later have her servants bring ritually cleansed peripherals for her to use. Shockingly, established scho establishment scholars have deliberately altered this work, allowing only the touched-up form of the rite to be published. They have suppressed or altered many works of the ancient Egyptian art because their stale theories leave no room for the truth. Ancient Egypt was wired. Oh boy. All right, let's see. So what is the minus Y2K bug? Minus Y2K refers to the year of minus 2000 age, where age stands for Anno Hegere, year of the Hajj or Hegera. Hegera. Of course, Egypt, being a Muslim country, uses a calendar based on the year of Muhammad's sacred pilgrimage to Medina known as the Hajj or Hegera. Wait a, wait a minute, not... Egypt back then wasn't a Muslim country 2,000 years ago. I mean, what the, what the hell? What's going on here? All right, let's go into this. The year minus 2000 AH is 1378 BC, the year which Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. How did the ancient Egyptians know to use the future Hajj as the basis of their calendar? Simple. In the... Okay, all right. This... <laughs> what are we what are we getting into man all right let's go into this the amazing but virtually true story the minus y2k disaster takes place at the end of the year minus 2000 ah or oo for short using the two-digit convention that had served ancient egyptian programmers so well for nearly nine decades ever since computers were first produced in minus 2089 that fucks with my head so hard. Minus 2089. The problem occurred at the transition of the year minus 1999, or in computer terms, at the transition of the computer year 00 to 99. Oh, so it goes backwards back then, motherfucker. <laughs> Relatively few modern biblical scholars or Egyptologists. That's, that's the first time I ever heard of that. Are willing to recognize that ancient Egypt used electronic technology and computers. All right. Uh, Moses... <laughs> What is this, man? Not only did Minus Y2K set Egypt back for several thousand years, it caused multiple miraculous events that catapulted a lowly Hebrew man named Moses to fame, giving him the reputation of well-biblical proportions. <laughs> oh, you fuckers. And enabling him to free thousands of Hebrew slaves. The Hebrews, of course, were legendary for their computer skills, but had been reduced largely to slavery. Their company... The one that largely started the Silicon Age, Israeli Business Machines, <laughs> IBM, had been the victim of a hostile takeover by Farasoft. <laughs> Fuck, man. And now even project leaders and land administrators of IBM were forced into abject slavery. You know, life in small cubicles without adequate break time and unfair performance reviews by narrow-minded Egyptian managers. Quotas? Man, you know, ancient Egypt was a lot closer to today's day and age than it was back in the day, man. All right, so they got a bunch of plagues. The rivers turn red. Frogs, lice and beetles, uh, plagues four and five, flies, 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 and beefs, uh, beef futures burst. Uh, plague number six boils and banes, hail and fire. I love how they compared it to, like, the computer side of things. I guess you could say, uh, what is this? Ferris approval ratings dropped 13%. Uh, number eight was locust and darkness. And the final plague was the Egyptian IRS had <laughs> worked hard to be minus YTK compliant. Well, with so little time, the future was futile. All records of income, land holdings, crops, and other forms of wealth were suddenly erased, appearing to be a hundred years too old to be of any interest. But the Egyptian IRS needed offerings and needed them urgently to meet their quotas and appease the gods and bankers. Man, no matter what century you go into, the IRS is a bunch of cunts. Anyways, going through over here, aftermath, blah, 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 blah. Moses became a hero, led his people on a 40-year journey, promising exciting new software upgrades that proved to be vaporware, <laughs> except for a couple of hard copy tablets that weren't executable files, at least not for many of his people. Frustrated by the difficulties of pro promoting new software in the absence of the technological infrastructure that Egypt once offered, Moses repented of his programmer hacker ways and turned to religion, many becoming one of the greatest li religious leaders of history. All right. So, for those of you, <laughs> what the fuck am I reading, dude? What was that? So, we've all heard of Y2K, but today, 
Y'all heard the skinned version of the negative year 2000 bug. Who said those Egyptians, you know, didn't have Pharaohsoft and Israeli business machines? What, what would their version of fucking Apple be, too? Like, could you imagine that? Let me know in the comments below what you think. We're going to hit up something, uh, I, I think, a little more realistic next. <laughs> let's, let's get out of here. And ladies and gentlemen, that was another episode of Deep Web Browsing, the series where we take a look at the danker side of the internet. Episode 101, good start to this set of episodes, I guess you could say. More interesting videos, very government alien oriented, which, hey, kind of throws back to the original videos to an extent. That being said, I've also, uh, I've also really liked focusing more on these videos uh, in a more analytical sense. I really like it rather than just combining seven fucking sites and not really giving them each the time of day. So we learned about bathroom etiquette, uh, an individual that discovered alien artifacts in the body, a alien implants, sorry, and uh, whatever that fucking video was. But hey, you know, that's just, a, that's just the fun of capstoning a Sunday off with the series. If you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Just like if you dislike it. This is me, Mudahar, and I am out.